Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show. I'm your host, Paul, and this video, we're breaking down Ahsoka. Episode 1 and 2 have just dropped online, and throughout this video, we're going to be breaking down the plot, easter eggs, hidden details, and also giving our theories on where we think the series will be going. I don't want to waste any of your time, so let's jump right into it and begin with the Red Lucasfilm logo and the character poppins. Shown solely in red, this changes for Chapter 2, where we get them adding blue in for certain avatars. This could show that slowly hope is bleeding into the universe, and that we're going to be steering away from the more dark side centric colours that this first intro is littered with. That also happened at the start of The Mandalorian as well, and that was to highlight how things were changing. Amongst them, we get the combat droids that we meet throughout the entries, and can also spot the helmet of Marok. In episode 2, Marok fights with an Inquisitor's blade, showing how a lot of the villainous stuff in this are remnants of the Empire. That plays off massively in the second entry at the Big Junk Factory, which we'll talk more about later on in the video. I also have a crazy theory time for Marek that you, you can probably guess off the thumbnail, but yeah, going into that, we're, we're going to be talking about that later on. Now, timeline-wise, this actually happens right after the events of the Mandalorian Season 2 Ahsoka episode, in which we saw her arresting the Magistrate and learning more about Thrawn. In regards to Rebels, this is said to be the quote-unquote fifth season of it, and though it doesn't pick up immediately after it, it's connected pretty closely to the events of that. We even get a sort of shot-for-shot -shot remake of the ending of the season come episode 2, with Sabine touching Ezra's mural before turning around to see Ahsoka. Again, it's sort of like poetry they rhyme, and it shows us how this series is building off the back of that. Now in case you need a quick catch up on the ending of it, it saw both Ezra and Thrawn being taken away by Pergil into unknown regions of the galaxy. We ended the series with the group waiting for an attack by the Empire, but it never came, and we then got a time jump to post Battle of Endor. Zeb and Kallus ended up going under the secret hyperspace path called Lyra San, and this was alongside Agent Kallus, which is where they saw the Lasat were now thriving. Zeb actually showed up in Season 3 of The Mandalorian, and this might explain what happened to him between this and that. Now we discover that Hera fought in the Battle of Endor alongside Rex and that she actually had a son called Jason, though we don't see him in these two entries. In the Avatar bit, we also get Professor Hu Yang from the Clone Wars, who's played by none other than David Tennant. Now in addition to this, there's then Chopper and Sabine's helmet, which then takes us into the first Star Wars series title crawl. Rather than beginning with the golden text that was common in the Skywalker saga, we instead get Red to highlight the dark side that's central to this show. This is kinda similar to the final arc of Season 4 of the Clone Wars, in which they swapped over to a red title card, and this was due to Darth Maul being reintroduced. Now we learn that, though the New Republic have provided peace, there's still a plot to find Thrawn, which would galvanise the Imperial Remnants and then start another war. This is something that they kind of touched upon in The Mandalorian with the Shadow Council, but as we know, you know, it never comes to pass, at least judging off this, the sequel trilogy. Now, the last paragraph talks about Ahsoka, and it kind of gives a lot of focus on the bit about her being a former Jedi Knight. This is very important to pay attention to, as I feel like this series is going to be about her learning to embrace the ways of the Jedi once more. Later on, she says she doesn't follow Jedi protocol. Let's just say I didn't follow standard Jedi protocol. This is kind of indicative of Anakin's training, and both Balin and Shen Hattie also play up the fact they're not Jedi either. We are no Jedi. <laughs> I think this is a central idea to the series as it comes into play with Sabine too and there's going to be lots of force sensitive characters carving out their own paths in a time when both the Sith and Jedi are at their lowest point. My guess is that Ahsoka will become one come the end of the series and that she'll go and help Luke set up his Doom training academy that's going to get smashed like it's the like button. <laughs> Either way, the title crawl also mentions Morgan Elspeth, aka the Magistrate from Season 2 of The Mandalorian. Back when that episode dropped, our editor Matt actually followed it up with a theory video on how Morgan Elspeth was actually a Night Sister. We get that confirmed in these episodes, so I'm taking credit for that, Matt. You, you bloody twat. And if you if you say anything, you f you fuck fired. Now, in case you don't know, Night Sisters are a clan of witches that lived on Dathomir, and in Jedi Fallen Order, you actually ended up teaming up with one. There's lots of subtle nods to that game throughout both of these entries, and deep down, I hope we get a live action Cal Kestis showing up one day. I just don't know who I'd get to play him though. Maybe, maybe that lad who plays Ron in Harry Potter. Maybe, maybe, but yeah, drop, drop your Cal Kestis perfect casting in the comments below. And I, pr I promise this isn't bait to get more comments. 
Anyway, the Night Sisters are powerful and mystical warriors, which explains why the Magistrate was able to go toe to toe with Ahsoka. Now we actually get lots of subtle nods to the movies in this opening, with us beginning by watching a ship coming in. This is similar to how A New Hope started, and there's lots of references to that early on. We're of course on a rebel cruiser with white interiors, and both Balin and Shin are shot in a similar way to how Vader entered. The costumes are similar to the rebel forces in that, and they get their asses handed to them as well to highlight the Empire's dominance. Now the ship appears to be the precursor to the Radis, which was the main ship that the rebels rode around on in The Last Jedi. In addition to this, there's also clear callbacks to both Return of the Jedi and The Phantom Menace. The shuttle arriving is akin to Vader dropping in on the Death Star, with the rampant smoke echoing how he made his entrance. There's also two Jedi-type figures here, which riffs on Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan arriving at the beginning of Phantom Menace. Now both Balin and Shin are master and apprentice, and they do lots of subtle things with them to highlight this fact. Balin is way more restrained with his use of the dark side, whereas Shin is aggressive and quicker to go and fight. This was something we saw most notably with Anakin and Obi-Wan, as the former just used to rush into fights, whereas the latter held back. Also, might be reaching, but I thought the line, We are no Jedi. Was similar to, I am no Jedi. Now the captain arrives to arrest them after realising they're just Imperial remnants, but yeah, not a great plan mate. Guessing Captain Hale just assumed these were disguised as Jedi and couldn't actually wield the force, but yeah, it, it's a bold strategy that that doesn't really pay out. Now they kick the crap out of them, and while Shin savagely busts them up, Balin calmly walks through the corridors, killing the rebel forces. It's very reminiscent of the Vader hallway scene from Rogue One, with this also being mirrored in Luke's arrival in the Mandalorian season 2 finale. Now, sadly, Ray Stevenson, who played Balin, passed away earlier this year, and the guy absolutely crushes it in this role, which makes it suck knowing that he died before receiving all the love that he would have got for this. The episode actually ends with a direct tribute to him, and it's really sad knowing this is going to be such a big role for him that he never got to see. Now, Balin ends up rescuing Morgan from his cell, which feels very reminiscent of Leia's rescue in A New Hope. Morgan tells him that Ahsoka is now looking for a MacGuffin to find Thrawn, and it's from here that we then cut to the title sequence. Now one thing I, I love about the score throughout the Ahsoka bits are that it's clearly based on ancient Japanese music. Lots of Star Wars was based on things like Hidden Fortress and Kurosawa's films which thematically pulls across to this lone samurai thing they have going on. The entry is also titled Master and Apprentice which ties in not only with Balin and Shin but also Ahsoka and Sabine who we'll talk more about in just a bit. Master and an Apprentice. That would be my assumption. We actually join Ahsoka, arriving at a temple on Darkona, which our new host MT pointed out riffs a lot on Zepho. He noticed that dotted throughout the area we have figures that are holding astriums, and that their hand positions even reference the one from the Zepho tombs. Theorising that these were an ancient alien race that studied the force in the galaxy, the man also brought up the Triquetra, which appears throughout both episodes. The Triquetra symbolises the Trinity, and the figures themselves may be a nod of the three ancient figures that were found on Zepho. That was Kujet, Alaram, and Mictrol, who are slowly appearing more and more in the lore of Star Wars, so I better learn how to pronounce their names properly. Now, MT's brought a hell of a lot to these videos, and I probably wouldn't have spotted that without the guy's help. Now, if you want to see the work he's done on both Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 and Across the Spider-Verse, then they're going to be linked below, so definitely check them out. He's also doing his own big Ahsoka Theory video that's coming on the channel very soon, so keep an eye out for that and make sure you're subscribed. Either way, we learn this was a Night Sister Temple, and at one point they are referred to as witches. Episode 2 is actually called Toil and Trouble, and this itself is a reference to the witches from Macbeth. Now, the inside of the temple is adorned with wall markings, and these somewhat make a return in the credits to provide the art style of that. They kind of riff on the ones from Jedi Survivor, and also seem like a golden version of the world between worlds. In Rebels Season 4 Episode 13, Ezra travelled through a doorway to this and it carried similar markings that all kind of tie this together. It was at this world between worlds that Ezzy rescued Ahsoka and her returning here is kind of symbolic of her attempting to track down both him and Thrawn. Finally getting one of the Golden Balls, this again looks like the ones from Fallen Order and its puzzle helps to unlock the unknown knowledge. Now outside of the tomb, she's ambushed by HK droids which I want to say are the evolution of Magna Gods. Used as henchmen by General Grievous in Revenge of the Sith, they also carry the lightsaber blocking Electro staffs that they did too. Upon being beat, they decide to self-destruct and this later 
Later causes a bit of a panic when they're trying to hack one in episode 2. And the whole scene reminded me a lot of the opening of Raiders of the Lost Ark with us getting a tomb before a big oh shit just run out as fast as you can scene. Also kind of riffs on the end of Predator with defeat leading to self destruction and our hero basically running to the channel like they've heard MTs doing videos. Rescued by Hugh Yang he shows up in a T6 shuttle which was an older Jedi form of transport put in to increase circulation during the Clone Wars. Later on, we get the full designation of it. Come in, Home One. This is T61974 on approach. Which could be a nod to George Lucas writing the first screenplay for A New Hope in 1974. Reach! We also get a radio message. Fulcrum, this is Home One. Do you copy? Over. With the code name Fulcrum being summing at Ahsoka used throughout Star Wars Rebels. Learning of the prison transport attack, we see X-Wing and a New Republic cruiser investigating it and can see that it's completely f***ed up the ship. Landing on board the cruiser, she's then reunited with General Hera, who's played by none other than Mary Elizabeth Winstead. Now she kinda has a connection to Star Wars already, as her husband's actually Ewan McGregor, aka Obi-Wan Kenobi. Hello there. Hello there. On the back of her jacket we can spot the spectre symbol as well and this was something that was part of the ghost crew. There's also the starbird on her arm and we know from the episode sent around her that this was part of her family crest. Looks is actually based the imperial and rebel logos off Japanese family crests and this was kinda carried over for Hera's as well. Now watching back a recording of Balin and Shin, it kinda reminded me of the hologram of Anakin cutting up six year olds at the Jedi temple. Which to be fair, the, 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 the kids deserved it mate, he, ha he had a lightsaber, he was uh, self defence. Now Ahsoka tells us the globe tells the position of the last Grand Admiral, aka Thrawn, which Hera rebuffs as being impossible. Believing he died at the Battle of Lothal, that was the one in which the Pergil took him and Ezra out of there. We can also see some Calamari commanders, and as a species they became high ranking ones amongst the rebels and therefore New Republic. Realising they need to figure out how the globe works, they then head out to Lothal to seek out Sabine. Sabine and Ahsoka made a promise to find Ezra at the end of Rebels, but as we learn, things didn't go that smoothly. Honestly, one of the criticisms I have of this show, and Lucasfilm's stuff in general, is that they tend to leave the characters on a positive high note, and then when they bring them back, they're in the opposite place of what they were. This is just seems to me like they just do to cause some dramatic tension, and all this stuff, it always happens off screen. This was the case with both Luke and Indiana Jones as well and it's kind of weird giving us a shot for shot remake of the ending of Rebels when they could have just hit the ground running from that point instead of taking two hours to get back to it. It's a nitpick, I understand I'm going off going off tangent there but it was obvious that we were going to end up back where we started so it made it feel a bit meandering. Anyway, nitpick aside, they go to Sabine and this is because of how smart she is as an archaeologist. She was the one who translated the Lothal runes and in the end she helped to free the planet. Now the monument still stands strong and we join a celebration for the victory of the Battle of Lothal which is headed up by Ryder Azadi. Played by Clancy Brown, he's now doing the character he voiced in live action, however this isn't the only live action Star Wars role that the actor's been a part of. He actually showed up in season 1 of The Mandalorian as Berg and ironically that was to do with the prison escape episode. We see his cam droids film the entire thing and these also come from the expanded lore. Now behind him is the mural for Ezra which depicts the crew of the ghost along with those two giant Lothal wolves. White and black, MT was saying these could potentially depict the light and dark side of the force which is something that could be connected to Ezra. Either way it's a perfect recreation of the one from the series with it even carrying across the animated style that was used for that. Sabine was supposed to be giving a speech there, but we find her doing a best Akira impression on top of a speeder bike. Listening to punky Japanese style music, this was, this was something that appeared in Rebels, and her passion for customising her stuff can also be seen here too. On her helmet, we can catch a drawing of a Lothcat, and she's also wearing one of Hera's jackets. We watch as she runs rings around the security forces that have been ordered to take her in, and it's clear that, yeah, no one's a real match for her. Now she's living in the Lothal communication tower which fans of Rebels will instantly recognise. This location was a hangout of Ezra before he joined Ghost and we can also catch some little things to make it home. There's a Loth cat, murals to them and Stormtrooper helmets with crosses on them showing how many Sabine took down. 
dotted around the room are both Storm and Scout Trooper helmets, and we also have her Mandalorian armor hidden away, symbolizing how she's turned her back on it. Sabine was originally the one who handed the Darksaber over to Bo-Katan, but she's no longer with them and is kinda like a long gun. She was trained as a Jedi, but both Kanan and Ezra sense that she wasn't actually force sensitive. Now in her belongings we can also catch another of Hera's patches, and Sabine actually took this in Rebels and used it as part of her armor. Still pining for Ezra, we can also see that she carries a holographic message for him, similar to the one that he left everyone at the end of Rebels. As she sits down and watches it, we can also catch a wolf drawn onto the wall, and she's kind of just existing instead of living. From here we cut to the Night Sister Temple, and it's at this point that we're also introduced to Marok. Marok actually has some ties to the expanded lore, and the bounty hunter Embo actually had a pet wolf that carried the name. The name itself actually comes from Sir Marok of the Round Table, who was an eyed of Arthurian legend. In the tales, Marok was turned into a wolf by a witch, which is where he continued to serve the realm in his beast form. Now it's through time, through time, can't get me fast, through time, three, one moment in time. So obviously, we don't know who Marok is, but they're a keen force sensitive character who's got leanings of the dark side. I actually think it would be pretty wild if this turned out to be Ezra, and that's why the character's wearing a mask. Morgan is a witch, and she may have turned Ezra into a quote unquote wolf by corrupting him through the use of the dark side. Ezra was also close to the Loth Wolves, potentially hinting at why he now carries this name. Could be a big reveal down the line, but yeah, it, if it's not me, it's just a few time, few time. If it's not meant to be taken serious, you dumb bitch. It's, you can't say I'm wrong, we can, but it's just an opinion. One moment in time. Now we've also just launched an Ahsoka and Grogu inspired t-shirt over at our merch store below, which is, it's just below the video. All of our few time Pulp Fiction and Marvel inspired merch is down there and it's the best way to help support the channel. Anyway, we cut back to Sabine and can catch her having a sort of forced dream about Ezra. Awoken by an alarm, she then steps out of the tower and we get a shot that echoes the ending of Rebels. That had Sabine leaning on the railing of the tower and she watched the T6 fly overhead with X-Wings escorting it. That happens here too and it's meant to bring things full circle from the last time we saw Sabine and Ahsoka. Sabine goes back on the ship, and Ahsoka goes off to take a dump, I think, and we see Sabine's bed on the T6 from her training. This contains sketches of Loth cats like her bed in the tower, as well as TIE fighters and the droid chopper. We get some of the tension between the pair playing out, with Sabine calling Ahsoka Jedi, and then both blaming each other for their failed relationship. The Professor also talks about Balin being a Jedi that disappeared after the Clone Wars, and he hints that Ahsoka's gonna need help to tackle him, and also his apprentice Shin. Guessing that he was trained there as a youngling and apprentice, and he does touch upon this later on in episode 2. The children of the Jedi Temple call it that. It comes from old stories. If he was one of those kids, this is where he'd have heard it, and it's a nice line that kind of paints out his backstory. You also get a little hint that she hasn't found Luke yet, as you can kind of take her thinking she's the only Jedi out there other than these two. Running off with the ball, we also watch as Sabine is stalked by Shin's probe droid, which is very reminiscent of Darth Maul's probes on Tatooine. Back with Ahsoka and Hera, we get some lip service paid to Ahsoka walking away from her master Anakin, and also the Jedi. Seeing herself as walking away from Sabine, she, she just basically thinks she's a failure and very much seems like she wants to right these wrongs. However, it isn't smooth sailing and we watch as Sabine's ambushed by Shin after solving the puzzle. This all happens because Sabine goes against Ahsoka's orders, which might make her think that she needs to listen to her more. I'm guessing the pair fell out because both refuse to listen to the other and you can kind of see that they start to mend their bridges. This puts Sabine in a really bad position though, and she has to bust out her lightsaber once more. Now we learn that this is actually Ezra's second lightsaber, which we saw him using throughout most of Rebels. Though she puts up a fight, Sabine's bested pretty easily, stabbed and left for dead, which is where we close out the episode. Now she's one of the only people who's ever survived a lightsaber wound like this, and it kind of puts a vendetta against her and Shin. Can kind of imagine Qui-Gon's force ghost just seeing another person survive this, uh, and, and standing off and being like, you damn son of a bitch. 
Now either way, I really enjoyed their fight, and though episode 1 had some dips in terms of pacing, I think on the whole it worked pretty well. There was a lot of atmosphere to it, and all the stuff with Shin and Balin really took this above just being more mundane Star Wars. Now Ahsoka arrives to stop her from dealing a killing blow, and that then takes us into episode 2. Beginning with a silver Lucasfilm logo, as opposed to the red one from the first episode, we also see as the Star Wars logo has switched to gold too. Echoing Luke's loss at the end of Empire, we see as Sabine's fixed up by a medical droid, but it also appears she's more in tune with the Force. Ahsoka seems to be able to hear her thoughts, and I think she's clearly starting to tap into things that she hasn't been able to before. Later on, the professor gives her a, a bit of a demotivational talk, and he puts the idea in her head that she needs to embrace her training. He basically says she should do it, even if Ahsoka isn't there, and if Ahsoka goes off to be with Luke, I, I think Sabine's still going to continue it. Now, I love how Ahsoka can sense she's about to have a nightmare, and just before this happens, she then wakes her up. This is because fear can cloud one's mind in a dream, and Anakin was of course put on the path to the dark side due to his nightmares of Padme. Now, I don't know if Sabine growing force sensitive is going to annoy people because typically you're either force sensitive or you're not. Oh, I, 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 and this is my headcanon, yeah? I always thought people like Han Solo, yeah? As they became more aware of it, they, they didn't necessarily tap into it, but they became stronger due to this. And, and this is why he was such a good pilot and fighter. What do you mean you've turned the video off? Now, what I'm saying is, is that basically if... If you, if you think hard enough, mate, you, you yourself, you can become a Jedi Knight and the thumbs up's right there. Force, force push it. Now that's kind of what I see happening with Sabine and we watch as Balin and Shin meet Elsbeth at a religious shrine like the one from Typhon and Mando. Known as a reflex point, this gives them knowledge of how to find Thrawn, which is where we close things out at the end of the entry. Now I love the way their ship is shot from behind once more and this echoes its arrival at the start of the first episode. Later on, Morgan puts a pawn into the architecture circle, and this sort of acts like its own star map. Now she lights us up using a green flame, which is something that the Night Sisters were also able to conjure. This lights up a pathway to Peridia, which the Night Sister says goes by another name. Now this potentially indicates that it holds another temple there, and we see as Morgan can tap directly into messages from Thrawn. Got lots of vibes of Raiders of the Lost Stark as well, and, and how the Staff of Rao had to be put in a certain place for the sunlight to guide the way. That's sort of what happens here, and the hologram globe also reminded me a lot of Prometheus, which is of course now also owned by Disney. Now you can catch Pergil on the map as well, indicating we might see them more as we get further into the series. Grogu actually spotted one in a hyperspace lane in Mando Season 3, so I can imagine we'll get them further expanded upon. They also mention the Eye of Sion, which we see at the end of the entry, and this could potentially be named after Darth Sion. Known as the Lord of Pain, this is an ancient Dark Lord who comes from the time of the Sith Lord War. Balin says that Thrawn will bring them more power, more than they've ever imagined, but I think it goes beyond what we consider it to be. If there's a temple at the other side, this could open up and tap knowledge, and help them to learn things that they never would have without it. Now Ahsoka does some investigating at Sabine's and turning on force detective mode, she picks up force echoes. This was something that too appeared in the Jedi games with Cal encountering them as sort of collectibles that filled in the history of an area. She also sees Ezra's hologram before being attacked by a droid and this is the mind that they hack into. Sort of like a hacking game and they break into its brain, kind of like how they did with C-3PO in Rise of Skywalker. Now we discover the droid came from a New Republic shipyard on Corellia, which was actually the home of Han Solo. It's very grey and dour, and it's sort of got this machine-like quality to the entire thing. In Mando Season 3, we discover the New Republic were dismantling Imperial stuff, and it's sort of a carryover from that with them apparently doing the same thing. Junkyards like this have appeared in the saga before, with us also seeing one on Brackair at the start of Fallen Order. This two appeared in the Bad Batch, and the, the sparkling nice glow over here shows the difference between the two sides. The New Republic's dismantling is clean and professional looking, whereas the Imperials had it like a desolate graveyard. Here we meet Min Weaver, who's in a sort of similar role to Tim Meadows' Colonel Tuttle. However, he's a private businessman who shows as Imperials at every level, which was something that the Mandalorian also touched upon too. We learn he's part of them as well, and the first clue that he's in cahoots comes when he refuses a direct order from Hera, even though she's a general. The New Republic defense fleet is mentioned as well, and this is basically the New Republic's version of a navy. 
Here we also learn that Ahsoka abandons Sabine and she somewhat mends her ways later on by going to help Luke's training of Grogu. I also feel like Sabine's self-doubt held her back, but embracing her training once more might push it forward. Now we learn that, though most of the ships have been destroyed, that they actually have a hyperdrive from a Super Star Destroyer. Ahsoka also brings up the HK droids again, aka Hunter Killers, which are what we learn have been used by Morgan. The protocol droid snitches and says that she spotted one, which is when the Imperials play their hand whilst the engine gets taken out of there. On the ground, Ahsoka goes toe to toe with Marek while we see Hera take to the skies riding in the Phantom. Now this was a hidden ship on the back of the Ghost and they'd often pilot it when doing special side missions. Alongside it is Chopper who gets to, he makes a big entrance and he, he adds a tracking device to the hyperdrive so that they can follow it. Now I love the way that Marek escapes and he calls his lightsaber back to him and we watch as Ahsoka just calmly dodges out the way. Back with Sabine we see as she cuts her hair short making her more closely aligned with how she was in Rebels. We also see she gets her armor out and can again catch a pair guild sitting on her shoulder pad. Focusing on her Mandalorian helmet, it is possible that she may become a Mandalorian Jedi and this would be similar to the path that Grogu's on. I wouldn't be surprised if she showed up in Mando at some point and potentially she'll be reunited with Bo for the next part. We then get a shot for shot remake of the ending of Rebels with Sabine going out of the mural and touching Ezra's face. Upon turning around, she sees Ahsoka has arrived and this brings things full circle from that. Again, kind of feel like we spent two hours just to get back to that point, but yeah, let me know all your thoughts below. Now tracing the tracking device, they then head out with Ahsoka calling Sabine her Padawan. From here, we jump to the Eye of Scion to see the hyperdrive being dropped off and this is a jump point that, that sort of showed up in the saga quite a lot. Feels like it's sort of the, the next step up from the one that the Jedi Knights had during the Clone Wars and their starfighters would of course dock in these and then head out. Balin clearly shows his conflict as he states there's so few Jedi left and it would be a shame to lose more in clashing with Ahsoka. Now we end with the station almost being completed and I'm guessing the next episode that'll be finished off before they head out looking for Thrawn. Now before we get into the review, I want to talk about the images of Thrawn from the trailer, so if you don't want to have anything potentially spoiled, then skip ahead now. You still here? Okay, well in the teaser we see him standing not only on the Eye of Scion, but also in a room that shows the world within world markings. Guessing that he'll be at a temple too, and that's how they'll connect, and the hyperdrive thing will lead directly to him. Also, when adding this bit into the video, I realised that if Marok is Ezra, then it explains why he has to use an Inquisitor's lightsaber as Sabine has his. Either way, it closes out these very first two episodes without finally feeling like things are now going to get going. And that's kind of where I'm at with the series, going off these first two episodes alone. There were parts that I really liked, but on the whole, it just kind of felt like they were setting things up rather than fully delivering on what I wanted to see. Emotionally, I feel like all the characters seemed distant and I found it a bit difficult to connect with them. They weren't the more light-hearted and charismatic ones I grew to love in Rebels and instead, I, I, I don't know, I just felt they seemed a bit stoic. Now, I'm not damning the show just yet, but I can totally see why they released two episodes at once. Pacing-wise, it, it was kind of all over the place with there being lots of slow moments and then them just dropping in the odd action scene to try and keep people's interests. It's still early days, but yeah, I thought this was a bit hit and miss, uh, though I know I'm in the minority judging off the reviews. Always kind of feel bad saying I wasn't enamoured with something, as I know you guys probably want someone really enthusiastic about a show bringing you breakdowns on it. It was fine, but yeah, I I'm hoping for a bit more, and maybe next week now the setup's out of the way, we can really get into it. Now, as you probably know, the release time has changed, and we're going to be getting episodes at 2am UK time. I'm going to wake up just normal time next week and see how we get on in terms of releasing a video slightly later and how much it affects the views, but I'd kind of feel bad telling all the team to get up in the middle of the night for videos when, you know, they've got families and stuff. So yeah, probably be dropping our breakdowns early morning on the Wednesday, but keep an eye out for it if you enjoyed this one. Please drop a like on the video if you did, and if you want to support the channel as a member of the Spoiler Society, then please click the join button. It helps all these videos get made, keeps a roof over our head, lets us be independent and it goes such a long way to helping us out. As a thank you, you'll get early access to videos every week and yeah, hopefully all the members who've signed up are enjoying the, the early content. Now if you want something else to watch, you've got a breakdown of A New Hope on screen right now, which I guarantee you, even if you've seen that movie a thousand times, which you probably have, there's going to be something in there that you haven't noticed before. 
We're really proud of the video, it's one of the best on the channel and hopefully I'll see you over there right after this. Without the way, I've been your host Paul, you've been the best and I'll see you next time. Take care, peace.